Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm humbled to be uh, in this place and with this audience, but uh, more so because I'm going to talk about an idea that is only um, a morning. I haven't figured out whether to do it yet. My editor and agent are in the audience, so they're saying, what the hell, you have a contract on your desk, but I'm still trying to figure out what to do here. So what I'm going to ask for is your advice and your help in this idea and to tell me whether it's a good idea and, and what I should do with it. So the idea is beta, or for any of you who are British in the audience, beta. Uh, I wrote a book called What Would Google Do? Here's the obligatory plug. Thank you very much. Still on sale. In hardback, I'm very glad to say. Uh, so the question tonight is, what should I do next? And I have a few ideas. The first idea I came up with is the idea of publicness. We've seen lately that Mark Zuckerberg has said that uh, privacy is over. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff about that. That's one idea. There's another idea I'm playing with these days about deflation. And deflation not as a bad thing, uh, necessarily. That our innovation in our society and in our economy is reducing the cost of everything. And that's going to have huge impact on all of us and present huge opportunity. And then the other one is an idea about process and how process is really what we're about now more than products. And that is beta. So that's what I'll talk about tonight. So this is beta, the alpha version. Um, what you're seeing is the entire thought process here. There is nothing more. Um, so this is where it starts, of course, with Voltaire. Uh, when I typed this up, I had a typo in it. I was tempted to leave it there and claim that it was a process of being beta, but I decided to fix it. Uh, so my, my French, uh, tell me, if, am I wrong in the French? Anyone can tell me? Is it all right? Okay. Um, so Voltaire said that the best is the enemy of the good. And that's so, so counterintuitive to the way we think because we, we tend to believe that there is a myth of perfection in what we do. That perfection is our standard. That anything less than perfection is bad. And this is true across our lives. It's true in media where we believe that we, we produce something um, uh, once we have, we have one chance to make a book and it better be right or else Ben and I will blame each other. Uh, we have one chance to make a car and it better be brilliant. And so these, I think, now, however, are vestiges of an industrial age. That we had to believe that when we had factories to produce stuff. We had to believe that we had one shot at making it right because we we're going to produce it a million times. And now we're in a different world. So there are these vestiges here. Among them are, I believe, that we reach the end of mass distribution, production, and marketing. Uh, Raymond Williams, the sociologist, said that there are no masses, only ways to see people as masses. Uh, I don't think you're a mass, are you? You may have sold to masses before, but you're not one. Uh, I'm not a mass. None of you here is a mass. We are all individuals, and the Internet and this world that we're in now gives us the opportunity to be individuals. And I think that's extremely empowering and very important. Um, we also created our industries and our worlds around the notion of a product, that we were done with something. There was a point where we were finished. And that's a myth, too. It was a myth necessitated by the means of production and distribution. But the truth is that life is a process. Everything is a process. And uh, I've seen this in media and journalism, where the idea that we put out this story once a day and this whole paper once a day, and here's the whole world in a box with a bow on it, is rather absurd. Stories our onions that you peel back constantly and learn more and more about. Uh, our knowledge is constantly evolving. Our understanding of the world evolves. So we live in a beta. So we are no longer prisoners to this system that we have. Uh, and I don't think we've yet gotten the idea of what that means to us. I don't think we realize the freedom that we now have to be imperfect. So the wages of perfection, I think, are many. I think we reached a point where we believed that, um, as I said about, about cars, you spend six years tooling up the factory to put out this car. You convince yourself that it is perfect, that it is the best car. You know better all along. Don't we in America especially know better when we bought American cars? They were never perfect. But that was the myth of the industry. Journalism, Lord knows we had this myth. And we're suffering from it to this day. Because we had this idea that we were going to put the news, as I said, in the whole world in this package and that we knew how to do, it, to do this and you didn't. And we were the best at it. And that led to a myth of objectivity. It's only one of the contributors to that. The fact that we ended up with um, monopoly papers that had to be one size fits all and we had a few networks also contributed to this. 
But it was the idea that we knew what we were doing. We knew how to put this world together. We were the ones who were experts. You weren't. Nya, nya, nya. And out of this came journalism. And I think we suffer now because when you put yourself up on a pedestal, the first step off of it is a doozy. Right? You are going to fall and crack your head uh, on that. And I think we can look back at, let's say, Dan Rather, who put himself up in the Tiffany Network on the pedestal, and he made a mistake. Hey, people do. But he could not admit that. And he cracked his head on the way down. Humpty Dumpty. Marketing is built on the idea of selling perfection. This is the best product you'll ever know. It's the greatest product. It is perfect. It is wonderful. Right? It's the whole idea is to sell how the product is the best. It is wonderful. It is perfect. It is great. But we all know that that's often not the case. Hollywood was built on the myth of perfection and still is. Right? And mind you, when I talk about this kind of stuff, when I talk about Google, I, I, I don't want to say for a minute that I expect a world where we all write the end of the movie. I don't want that world. I want the author and the director to write the end of the movie and I want to judge them for that. So I'm not suggesting that I turn everything over to, to some kind of new creative democracy and chaos. I'm not suggesting that. But I will suggest that one can be wiser by listening and the problem with Hollywood is, and with TV and other media is they convince themselves of their priesthood. They convince themselves that because they did it the way they did it, because it was so expensive, it was the right way. Years ago, I worked for Time, Inc., and I got stuck doing geeky stuff with computers. And I remember a fight once about, about a system that they bought, and this is really nerdy and geeky and boring. But honest to God, one of the executives said, basically, we spent the most for it, so it has to be the best. And that's what media commits themselves of all around, is that we were the priests who knew how to do this. Fashion. Fashion comes from on high. Right? I used to work at Condé Nast. Anna Wintour would go to the show, would sit there with your arms crossed, just like that, and judge the world and say, is this good, is this bad? I shall tell you what it is. Well, I'm not sure we're there anymore. Certainly we are to some extent, but we see uh, examples of how fashion is even being broken up. All you have to do is walk down the street and see the fact that people create their own looks. Is that all slavishly following what uh, the Garment District of New York says? No, I don't think it is anymore. Government. This is an interesting one. I, I went and spoke a, a few months ago to a bunch of, uh, to 500 government webmasters in Washington, which sounds like a dreadful bunch, but I actually liked them because they laughed at my jokes. They were very nice people. And, and as I spoke with them, I, I learned something. Because I talk about this idea of beta, of learning things, of trying things, of failing, of process. And they, I learn, have a utter phobia of failure. Right? Because we instill that in them. We say, you're spending my money. You better get it right. And when you get anything wrong, we go after them. Right? We go after the bastards. There are bastards to go after. But if we have that attitude about government, how are we ever going to get innovation? How are we ever going to get anything other than what we've already gotten? Because they have this myth of perfection. So I said to them, I said, well, the problem is you have no license to fail. And they said, oh, shit, yeah, you're right. We don't. That's their problem. So government can't be a beta. Education. <laughs> this is a critical one. I have a 17-year-old son who's now applying for college. Please light a candle for him. Uh, we have 12 applications off in all kinds of places. He, he, he's, he's a, he's, of course, he's a brilliant, wonderful, perfect child because he's mine, as is my daughter, too. Um, Jake, uh, my son, wrote uh, Facebook applications and sold them for enough to, to buy a year in college. Uh, he's doing very well at this. But he's going through an educational system that makes me feel very guilty that I did not have the guts to break him out. The educational system believes that there is one right answer. The educational system turns out people like cookie cutter sheets. There is one right answer. You will all have the same answer. and That's that. In What Would Google Do? I talked about how Google views this. And Google says that they don't want the one right answer. Their example that I gave in the book is that the problem of misspelling, what's the obvious way to solve the problem of misspelling? What's the, what's the obvious thing? If you have misspelling, what do you, where do you go? But dictionary, right? Dictionary, not Google. Google instead listens to us and all of our misspellings and where we go then and learns. And that's how we got this magnificent miracle of, did you mean? 
right? By the way, just, just a little aside here. If you haven't tried this yet, it's magnificently scary. If you go to the Google homepage now and you type in weather in and you start typing CH, it will not only predict that you want Chicago, if you're here in the U.S., but it, not only that, it will give you the weather for Chicago in the search box. You don't even have to go anywhere. Google's desire is to intuit your intent. I just find that amazing. Some people find it scary. I don't. I find it awesome. But anyway, how can we create the next Google if we're churning out cookie-cutter students everywhere as we are? They're all giving the same answer. They're not thinking in creative new ways. That's why this school is so important to emphasize the discipline of creation. Is there a beta god? Um, well, yeah. I mean, God's not perfect. He made us. We were imperfect, right? If you were perfect, we'd be perfect. We're not. Boom, God, you lose. God made mistakes. Why was there a flood once upon a time? Because he screwed up. Wanted to get rid of it all. Start again. Clean slate. Whiteboard, right? God's a beta too. And I hope I don't get struck down. So, those are the wages of perfection, I argue. I argue that there are those who will say, no, perfection as a standard makes us reach higher. I think it makes us give up. I think it makes us lie to ourselves and to others. I think it gets us in some measure of trouble. So, what is, in contrast, beta think like? By the way, if you like, has anybody seen this kind of presentation before? It's called, from a company called Prezi. I'll give them a plug. P-R-E-Z-I or P-R-E-Z-I if you're from the UK or Canada. And it's really quite a wonderful program that lets you kind of rethink your thoughts around. Right? So it becomes this, this now I'm not going to find it again, this view. And you can always go back and always start over again. It's really quite nice. All right. So beta think. How do you do a beta? The first problem of a beta is knowing when it's done enough. If you put out a beta too soon, it's crap. If you put it out too late, there's no chance to do anything to it. So there's still a moment when you put out a beta and that you try things. Go back to Google again because it's on the brain. Uh, has any, have you all heard of something called Google Wave? Anybody heard of Google Wave? Right. Anybody explain it to me? No, it's extremely complex, extremely difficult, but extremely powerful new tool that Google's created for live collaboration. It's really quite amazing. They put it out very early because they want us to tell them what it can do but it confuses the hell out of people, and it's a problem for beta. Important point about, about beta, about releasing something before it's done, when you do that, as I say, and what would Google do? When Google releases a beta, it is saying necessarily, this is imperfect, it's unfinished, and that is necessarily a call to collaboration. It has to be. Because you're saying, we know this isn't done yet, so what does done mean? The example I use in the book um, is of Google News. They released it on, they were, they were ready to release it on a Thursday, but you never release technology things on a Thursday because, or a Friday because it ruins your weekend when it breaks. So on Monday, they released things. They had time to do one more feature. They didn't decide, however, what it should be. Should it be search by date or search by place? The geeks couldn't decide. They put the product up. Monday came along. They had 330 emails in the afternoon. 300 of them said, would you please give us search by date? So the, opening yourself up as a beta opens yourself up to ideas from other people, and that opens yourself up to generosity of other people. 330 people took the time to email Google to say, I wish you'd do this. You should do this. Here's what you should do to fix your thing. And, and, and they knew there was an openness to it because Google called it a beta. There's a wonderful thing that happens then when you let the customers take control. Again, I don't want anarchy or pure democracy, but I do want the idea that you hand over this idea to people and they can, they can join in the control. So I would argue that the new wave of marketing here is not that we have perfection, but instead that imperfection becomes a marketing tool because it changes the relationship you have with your customers. When you put out this product that is imperfect and unfinished, when you open up to the ideas of your public, when you use those ideas to make it right, what you've really done is changed your relationship with your customer. You have now become a collaborator with your customer. And that's really powerful. And to me, that becomes a new form of marketing. 
we talked today in the class about, about what happens to marketing. After we got, I got finished killing newspapers and magazines and TV, then who's next? It became advertising. And I'm not trying to kill them all. Really, I'm not. Um, but there, there's, a, there's a, a way I look at it these days. That you could argue that advertising is failure. Think of it this way. In the ideal world, you have a product that you love. Damn good water. Right? Great bubbles. I love this product. I'm going to sell this product to you. I'm going to tell you how wonderful this product is. I'm going to tweet about the product. I'm going to blog about the product. I'm going to market the product. The product breaks. You don't know how to use it. I'm going to help you support it. How wonderful is all that, that your customer can do that if you're open to it. That's the ideal. The ideal is you have a great product or service. People love it. They sell it for you. They support it for you. Why should you advertise when that fails? Advertising is failure. Now, mind you, I've now shook this up, so it's going to be awful. Um, mind you, I hope for a lot of failure because I work in media and advertising sports media and I want to eat and I want my students to eat. But it says that this whole world is going to change and if you think about how this changes, look at Zappos. You all know Zappos, right? Zappos only started, does anybody not know Zappos? Okay, you all know. So, so it only started advertising after Amazon bought them. Zappos puts its money into customer service, customer service is advertising. So having this new relationship is what advertising is going to be all about. Confession is good for the product. Um, we in journalism shied away from errors. We hate to make errors. We are ashamed of making errors because after all, remember, we're supposed to be perfect. And when we aren't, horrible things happen. I've learned in blogs a new ethic of the correction. And I've learned that what happens when you correct yourself is that it does not diminish your credibility. It enhances your credibility. Because now people will trust that the next time you screw up, you'll say so. And you won't hide, you know, up on top of your pedestal or behind your, your castle wall. Betas are simpler. I was talking tonight with somebody. I, I founded the magazine Entertainment Weekly. And someone here tonight knew that uh, it was redesigned at a record time in only 15 weeks after it launched. And this person asked me, why would that happen? And I said, well, it's because the design sucked. I, as editor, had to defend the design because I was the editor, but the truth was it sucked. And we knew it. Um, the problem, by the way, I say this in the hallowed halls of art directors, was that I let the art directors futz too much. The design about seven weeks before launch was good. They should have stopped there and I should have made them go on vacation. Instead, they futzed and they futzed and they futzed. They got too busy and it was mess. It was mess. Um, well, the beauty of a beta is you send it out when it's just ready enough. It's anti futz right? You want it to be good enough. You want it to be simple. You want it to express what it is very simply, and that's a good thing. So I think betas have, in these couple of ways, a good impact on the product. Betas are faster. That's pretty obvious. No, 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 I can't get this out. It's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. Get it out. We'll find out what it is after we get it out of here. That's what you want to do. Now, there's questions, I think, about how does this come across from just making products to other parts of what we do. If you are a beta manager, I mean, I've had bosses who insisted, who tried to make me believe that they were perfect, every decision was right. Clearly, that's wrong. Um, so the question becomes, how does this go over into how we run our, our business lives? How do we manage? How do we become open and collaborative with our own staffs? Clearly, good managers do that. They long have. But it's a hard thing to do because there was a myth of perfection even in the executive suite. So, what does a beta nation look like? What does it look like when we start to think this way, if indeed you think this isn't full of bullshit and we should? Or that we're not already headed this way? Let's look at a few of the institutions here. Technology, obviously, already, Google does this. We know Google does this. This is how they think. Uh, and, and, and I can be well accused of being the Google fanboy because I wrote the book. Um, I'm critical of them in a few ways. I was critical of their China policy. I'm very glad to see what they're doing there. Um, you know, they don't do everything perfectly. I do have, by the way, you're all going to be jealous, my Google phone, the Nexus One. And this is a, a line that will mean things only to Americans, but remember the debate when uh, a candidate said to another candidate, uh, Senator, I know Jack Kennedy, you're no Jack Kennedy. Well, Google phone, I know the iPhone, and you're no iPhone. Um, it's good, but it's not great. But, what, but what's important about it is that it is a symbol and a vehicle of openness. That this, the iPhone, is magnificently controlled, and we'll soon see what Steve Jobs has in mind for us in the tablet, 
and I await a wow, I suspect it'll be amazing. And uh, he's quite wonderful. And he doesn't put out betas as a rule. And he is the grand exception to all rules. Google's willing to put this out and say, we'll fix it as we go. And it works. And they make a fortune. There's a company in Massachusetts called Local Motors. Really quite kind of fascinating. Uh, this guy uh, thought that the way to solve Detroit was not to bail it out, for God's sakes. Uh, was not to fix those companies as they exist, but to create new companies. As we talked today in the class, I emphasize that any company out there, any institution out there, should be imagining its own demise. Because some kid in a dorm room is doing just that to you. And if you don't imagine it yourself and figure out how to get to that future yourself, you will die. So this guy is doing that with cars. He said, let Detroit go with it. Let it die. Who cares? And he starts a new kind of car company. And he's starting micro factories built around collaborative design with the customers. So the first car is a muscle car that they're building in Arizona. No, it's not a hybrid fancy pants New Yorkers. Um, it's, a, it's an Arizona car. And the design was, there was a competition of the design that was done openly. And, and, I, and I love this little part of the story. The audience came in and they loved a taillight that was designed. And the CEO of the company said, yes, you're right. It's a beautiful taillight. But if I have to tool up the factory here to make that taillight, it's going to add $1,000 to the cost of every car. You want it still? If you do, I'll make it. The community said, nah, no, never mind. And they went off and they found a Honda lens that cost, I believe, $79. And the designer designed around it in a way you would never know it's Honda and everybody was happy. Isn't that amazing that the public, the customers, made economic decisions around the product, design decisions around the product because they were given the chance to. And that is, is possible because the company opened itself up to this process. I argue with what would Google do, that if Detroit had had this process in place many years ago, people like me would have told them, hey, assholes, put a 39 cent plug in the radio so I can plug in my iPhone or my, at the time, Walkman, right? They didn't listen to us. They had no means to hear us because they were the ones who knew how to make cars. We didn't know shit. Well, that's the problem. Zara, uh, I'm too old. And dumpy to shop at Zara. I'm sure some of you can shop there, but I don't. But I'm amazed by one of the stories of Zara is that when people come in, I'm told, secondhand, and they make a suggestion for a fa fashion, Zara will make that fashion for that store. And imagine the customer coming in the next week and saying, shit, I suggested this and they made it. And then Zara will test it out there and see what happens. And if it works, they'll put it out in other places. If it doesn't, they won't. Beta fashion. Gawker. We all love Gawker, right? Nick Dutton's Gawker, amazing thing. Uh, Nick is, can be accused or will accuse himself of ruining journalism. Uh, that's what he's trying to do. But he's actually an amazing journalist in a lot of ways. And he argues for the beta story, too. He puts up stuff that is, as he calls it, a half-baked post, which he says is telling the public, here's what I know, here's what I don't know, what do you know? And it is through that that you get to the whole of the story. You get closer to the truth only if you're willing to release that. Cable news, in a sense, has been doing that too because it's live. And we've had to learn how to judge cable news as it happens. And beta entertainment, I'm not sure about because, again, I do want that authorial voice. I want that responsibility put on the author or the director or the composer. Uh, but I guess you could argue that jazz is beta. I'm not a jazz fan. Uh, television without pity treats television shows as betas because it gives people the opportunity to come in and say what should happen to the characters they love. And smart producers listen to it. Zappos, once again. Zappos is an incredible company, I think. Uh, it puts its money into service. You've, have you all probably heard the stories about Zappos. Uh, you know, one of the famous stories is that a, a, a woman had to call and send her shoes back because her husband, for whom she bought them, had died. And not only did they not give them any hassles, my, my, my brother-in-law, God rest him, died a year ago, and my sister-in-law uh, had to cancel thus a trip to Florida that she was going to take with him, and the airline was a complete and utter asshole and fought her on it. Is that any way to treat people? It's incredible. Zappos, the customer service people, are empowered to have direct relationships with people, and the customer service person who got this call sent her flowers. Didn't have to do that. 
Right? Didn't do it for any particular reason for the company, but just said, I'm a human talking to a human. This is what it's like. And if you open up to that way, it's possible. Well, that becomes a new kind of service. Zappos is constantly, constantly learning. So to me, that becomes the new advertising. The service is the advertising. What I think happens in this new deflated economy is that you don't spend as much money on advertising. You put the money instead in a, trans in a market where there are transparent prices, where, where you can't really support opaqueness of brand pricing anymore. But what happens is that you're going to compete instead on the quality of the product and the quality of the service, and that's going to be what people talk about, and that's how you advertise. And that's a different world. Life is a beta. Right? Life is unfinished. All of life is. Marriage is unfinished. My wife will be the first to tell you. Kids are unfinished. Lord knows, aren't they? Right? Our lives are unfinished. It's all a beta. And I haven't really delved into this idea much yet, but I, I think there's, just as we have this assumption about products being perfect, I think we start to assume that our lives can be perfect, and thus we're constantly failing against that goal. And if we say that our lives are just constantly a process, if we kind of know, then something else happens. I want to do a moment, because we're here for this group, on beta media. We've talked already about the notion of process versus product. Beta equals transparency. If you are beta, you are open, you are thus transparent, you are saying what you don't have, what you don't know, what you need. Beta then yields collaboration. And I think that's the most important and powerful part of this. Importantly, it is the link that enables collaboration. Pardon me for a moment's uh, detour from the detour here uh, on the power of, of the link uh, in, in, the, in what I call and what would Google do, the link economy that we are in. Um, it never ceases to amaze me what all that enables in, in how media operates. That this, 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 this little thing, the link, that changes how the economics operate, how we view facts, how we relate with each other, uh, all of this stuff. And it's the link that enables collaboration because people can simply point to each other. And I argue that there is a right to the link. Uh, News Corp just cut off an aggregator in, in the UK called NewsNow. Uh, and that's fine. You can go to your little robot text file on your web page and say, don't scrape me, and that's fine. But as I thought about this, I realized that there's kind of a right to link because what happens in public is public. We, the public, own the right to comment on it, to show it, to share it, to link to it. The link is how we do that now. So you're all taking pictures of me right now. I don't know what the hell you're going to do with them. Because I'm boring, but fine. Um, and clearly I don't object because I have an ego the size of Utah. And that's fine too. But when we go out here, and we, if tonight or tomorrow we find a Google Street View van coming down the street, taking a picture of us as we go down the street, well, um, some people say, oh, that, that, that's my privacy. No, it's not. You're in public. And if we allow a Google, if we allow people to say, Google, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that, which is happening in Europe. We are also then saying, remember, the, the, realize what the implication of that is. We are then also saying to journalists who might catch a politician, oh, I don't know, the governor of New York, going into, I don't know, Rick's cabaret up the street, and say, no, no, he has the right to tell you, you can't show that. No, governor, it's in public. Public is public. We have to protect the public. Pardon me, that was just a little... The link economy versus the content economy is just to say that, that the media world operates differently today and we are trying to shoehorn in old models of media into an entirely new world. And that's what's not working, folks. So, the imperatives of the link economy. Now a detour to the detour to the detour. Just real quickly. In this link economy, in the content economy, if this were my book, yes, I'm a hypocrite. I made a book. I made money off of it. Thanks to that man back there. I love this. It's great. If I were truly uh, of uh, uh, doing what I say, I would have made it digital, searchable, linkable, clickable, and uh, fine. But I didn't because my kids got to go to college. So it's fine. I'm a hypocrite. I admit it. And the, the content economy, God bless it, still works long enough for me to have at least one, maybe two books. God bless it. I love that. That's great. Uh, but online, you need only one copy of anything, and it is the links to it that bring it value. So thus, there are two content creations here, two value creations, I mean. 
Those who create the content create value, but those who create the public for it also create value. And in that world, each may get compensation. So when certain publishers complain about Google and say, oh no, they're stealing my content when they link to me, they're not doing that at all. Google is giving you a great gift. It's up to you to decide what you do when you get that link, what you do with that person, and how you build that relationship and what value you find in that. Indeed, I could argue, I won't, but I could argue that Google should charge you for linking to you because that's value creation. But Google doesn't because it would hurt their credibility and hurt their business, and that's not the way they think. So you have to be searchable to be found in this link economy. If you're not, you don't get the value. The link forces specialization. You do what you do best and then link to the rest. It forces efficiency because you are only doing that now and it becomes a different P&L. And he or she who gets the link monetizes it, figures it out. That's the link economy. So what this means is that companies, I think, become more collaborative than owned. We end up with an ecosystem instead of an industry or a corporation. I was at a conference in New York a few weeks ago, and there were um, uh, new companies like, like uh, uh, YouTube and LinkedIn and Foursquare and Twitter, and they kept talking about the ecosystem of which they're a member. They didn't talk about an industry they control. It's a very different language and a very different way to think about things. When you open up in this way, when you become collaborative, when you depend upon that collaboration, you must give value to people you used to try to shut off. So it means you think about creating networks more than companies. Part of what we discussed this afternoon about, about media companies. that they, Rather than trying to own and control everything, which is very expensive, very risky, how can you become a network? It means that you think distributed rather than centralized. The old way the media works is you must come to us because we have everything. Not anymore. Indeed, the audience becomes the distributor. There was a young woman who said to a college, a young college-age woman who said to a researcher, quoted in the New York Times a year ago, and she said, if the news is that important, it will find me. That's really frightening for media people because we expected people to come to us for it. Well, now, young people are saying, no, 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 you've got to come to me. You've got to be in my Twitter feed. People have to recommend you. They have to point to you if this is worth it all, anything at all. So you've got to think distributed. It means then, I believe, that the future of so many industries is entrepreneurial rather than institutional. In this avalanche of the Internet that we've seen coming down the mountain, hitting media first, we've seen the media institutions didn't know what to do over the last 15 years, and now they're in rather great desperation. We see the New York Times today trying to charge and punish its best customers with whom it has its best relationship. We see desperate ideas that, the tablet will save us, as if it's come down from Mount Sinai, not Steve Jobs. Uh, these are desperate moves of desperate people. And I think what's really going to happen in the future of media, I teach a course in entrepreneurial journalism at CUNY where I teach journalism, and I have eight students now with money I got from a grant, uh, seed money, out there starting businesses right now, and I hope and believe that they are be creating the future of journalism. So, that is beta, the alpha version. It's an idea that is very much in progress. I haven't uh, really thought it through at all more than that yet. But I wanted to take the opportunity because when I wrote What Would Google Do, I got incredible benefit out of doing my thinking in public. And one last, last little illustration. Um, I didn't put the whole manuscript up because A, my contract wouldn't let me, uh, but B, it didn't make any sense to do that, really. It says, this is done already. I'll allow you to comment on it. That's no good. So what I did instead was I thought through the ideas. Indeed, a lot of the ideas I had thought through before I had the idea for the book. One day I came along and I said, you know, I've got to think of, of industries that are not, cannot be Googleified. Because I, I, in the book I gave all kinds of ideas of what can be Googleified, and, and it's fun stuff, and I speculate about what Googly restaurants are like. A little aside, I talked to a Twitter conference once, and I talked about that. What would a Googly restaurant be like? One of the people said, well, of course, at the end of the meal, they give you a cookie so they can know where you go next. Um, so I said in my blog that I could imagine three industries that could not be Googleified: Law, PR, and insurance. My readers disagreed only with the last one. Seth Godin, the business author, came in immediately and said, Jarvis, you're not thinking nearly big enough. No, insurance is a matter of mutual uh, benefit. It is, a, it is a community and a society operating prop, prop, properly. Others came in, as I remember, Sean came in and 
gave me great here. Uh, an, an alumni, are you an alumnus yet? Yeah, okay, you finished. Thank goodness. Congratulations. You let them out. That's good. Um, came into the comments on the blog and made very smart things about how a mutual society like this would work. I ended up writing the chapter out of the comments in the blog. Indeed, Ben Lohan, my editor, thought that it sucked at first because I was just quoting the whole thing and I had to go in and add a little more writing and actually earn my money. But it was beta in that sense. But um, the chapter was written by my readers, not me, because I was being public in this. The book was a beta. I learned a great deal about that. So I figured in this case, why not start at the very first of this idea, the very first, and try to get some response from you. And so tell me where I'm full of crap, what's wrong, what I haven't thought through, uh, anything at all, or your thoughts on beta. I would be very grateful.